And what we're all saying is that the Alexander Technique is a good technique to retrain individuals in how to maximize their functional use when that functional use has been affected by a disease. The way you sit, the way you stand and walk, the way you bend, push, pull, and lift, the way you do everything, every day, is in large part a result of habits developed over many years. Hello, I'm Frederick Lacey. The world's most interesting mystery is not here on Easter Island, it's not in Machu Picchu, or even in Egypt. The world's most interesting mystery is right inside of you. As an infant, you started out with a naturally upright carriage and way of moving. Your head, although large, was carried in perfect balance over your torso. Your back was upright and free of tension. Very little muscular effort was required to maintain your balance. You could sit on the floor with grace and ease. It was as if gravity didn't exist. But then, for most of us, things began to change. We sat in chairs and began to slump. Learning how to write, we hunched over our desk. Our heads were no longer balanced over our bodies. Sitting in front of the TV and computer intensified the problem. Now, we exerted much more energy to counteract gravity. Muscles that were not needed in infancy were called into action, and other anti-gravity muscles that were so effective earlier were weakened. The effortless sitting of infancy was replaced by sitting with tension in the muscles of our neck, shoulders, and back. Sitting upright became tiring and no longer comfortable, so we allow our back to collapse down into a habitual slump position. This carries over to standing and walking. We walk with rounded shoulders and a constricted chest. Our torso is no longer reaching upward. Muscles that are not really needed for locomotion are used against gravity and to counteract each other. This inefficient posture and way of moving is now a habit. What we tend to do is slump. We are a culture that exists in a slumping pattern. Now, there's no harsh judgment there, even if you're doing it as you're listening to this. Likewise, we now habitually bend from the waist instead of using our hips and knees as we did when squatting as infants. There is excessive tension in all our movements. We are misusing our bodies. This habitual misuse commonly leads to aches and pains in our neck and shoulders, and particularly in our lower back. In an attempt to relieve pain, we may now stand and walk with a flattened lower back, bent slightly forward at the waist with our head held back. Various other configurations may develop. These become habits, all of them not good. We no longer move with ease and poise. Everyday activities are tiring. We lose fluidity and suppleness, which affects every aspect of life, even our golf and tennis games. And in general, we function at a level far below our natural capacity. To make matters worse, we are completely unaware of what has happened to us. These habits are deeply ingrained and now feel normal. As young adults, we generally consider the adverse effects of our poor habits as just inconveniences. For some, however, because of muscle strain and compression forces on the spine, back pain in particular becomes a more serious problem. We seek help from doctors, chiropractors, and alternative medical practitioners. We take painkillers, muscle relaxants, herbal remedies, or a few drinks. We get adjusted, stretched, exercised, and massaged, all with varying degrees of relief. But the underlying habitual misuse is still present, and we continue to suffer. As the years roll by, 
more and more of us fall victim to significant ailments and disabilities. Compression in the system is not healthy. We know that osteoarthritis, digestive diseases, migraine, many of the chronic illnesses in our society are a result of compression. In time, the effects of many years of habitual bodily abuse catch up with most of us. Much of what we have come to expect as old age is in part due to our lifelong bad habits. Of course, there are some among us who through heredity and a better environment or training are able to maintain the anti-gravity reflexes of infancy and do not develop bad habits. Some outstanding few excel in sports and other endeavors requiring the best use of their bodies. Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali, and Fred Astaire to name a few. We also see examples of good body use in many of the so-called primitive peoples in parts of the third world where an unspoiled way of life contributes habitually elegant and graceful movement. They are balanced and wonderfully upright. They can walk with a heavy load on their head for miles and are perfectly comfortable squatting. Unfortunately, for most of us in the modern world, bad habits developed over years are a continual drag on our health and overall well-being. And, like all deeply ingrained habits, they are virtually impossible to change. That is, unless you learn to use the Alexander Technique. Born in Australia in 1869, Frederick Matthias Alexander was probably the first Western professional to recognize an interdependent relationship between thinking and the body's muscular system. 100 years ago, the concept of unity in mind and body was new and Alexander was very much ahead of his time. He discovered that all muscles in the body are interconnected and that the special relationship of the head and neck to the torso was a sort of master control which coordinates both the brain and muscles throughout the entire body. Animal studies have also confirmed this interconnectivity within the muscular system and the key importance of the head and neck in coordinating muscular activity and in allowing anti-gravity reflexes to function properly. When consciously applied, this connection reestablishes the light upreaching and balanced carriage of infancy while sitting, standing, and during other everyday activities. What we're hypothesizing here is that if, if this isn't so free to move, that your movement patterns are more difficult. Alexander moved to London in 1904, where he became well known for his technique. People with postural problems and a variety of ailments and disabilities came to him for help from all over Europe, and some even came from the United States. Very well-respected doctors, educators, and high officials came and testified as to the value of his work. Aldous Huxley, George Bernard Shaw, and many singers, dancers, and actors swore by him. Sir Charles Sherrington, a world-renowned neurologist and Nobel Prize recipient, was an ardent advocate. In 1930, Alexander started the first training course for his method, and today there are over 2,500 certified Alexander teachers worldwide. Each has successfully completed a three-year training program at an accredited school. Alexander teachers today use his teaching methods with little modification. While the student gives his body the mental directions, the teacher gently encourages the desired movement. This influences the body to follow the student's mental directions and it helps the student's brain connect with a new sensory perception of what is desired. This hands-on approach is used during sitting, standing, getting in and out of a chair, while lying down, and during other everyday movements. The Alexander work is not body work. It is not a therapeutic model. It's an educational model. 
the only reason the teacher uses his or her hands when they teach is to enable the student to learn faster. While continuing to give directions for primary control, head, neck, and torso, the student may be asked to direct a specific movement. In this way, movements can be further refined for easier and more graceful performance. My take on this at the moment is that light touch would affect a student's peripheral receptors, and we know there are many different types, the somatosensory cortex and the basal ganglia, that motor learning regions are affected just by touch. We divide the motor system into conscious and unconscious. And this light touch is affecting those unconscious areas. The sessions are designed to help the student become more aware of his body and to combine this awareness with the mental directions. Your head is moving forward and up. Your torso is lengthening and widening to follow that, which frees up the, the hip, knee, and ankle, and movement starts with the knee going forward. Alexander had to invent a new language in order to communicate these ideas. You'll learn about faulty sensory perception, inhibition, direction, conscious control, and end gaining. Alexander discovered that he could affect change only by actively using his mind. He called this conscious control. The secret is that the initial phase is a momentary stopping action that cancels the old patterns of poor body habits. He called this inhibition. And Alexander used the word inhibition before Freud. Doesn't mean to suppress oneself. But there's another way of looking at it. It's a biological, a neurophysiological way of defining the word inhibition. It means your ability my ability to say no to an unnecessary pattern. Next, by using your mind only, with no direct muscular effort, you tell your body to allow itself to lengthen and widen. This is directing. When you think about moving, the parts of the brain that move you light up. When you move, the parts of the brain that move you light up. There is no difference on the MRI scan. These mental directions ask for the release and lengthening of muscles, quite the opposite of the muscular contractions used to effect change directly. This is a natural pattern for all vertebrates. Please notice the first action. The head leads the torso. The action begins with a releasing of the neck muscles, not a pushing. You can try this for yourself. So we can experiment a little bit. As you're sitting there, why don't you just, I'll do it with you, just watch me ever so delicately. Why don't you just think of letting your head ease up right away from your shoulders, very, very easily, not trying to push it up, but gently allowing it to release away from your shoulders and your torso follows, it's all connected. While experience has shown that a teacher is necessary to guide the student's mind-body connection, the goal is to teach the student to use the technique during all daily activities on his own. As the student's use of self improves, there is less need for the teacher. Students benefiting from Alexander lessons fall into several categories. Back pain and stiffness and associated postural changes are generally markedly improved. This is the case even when intervertebral disc degeneration and associated nerve root compression are present. The Alexander technique tends to straighten the spine, decreasing compression on the intervertebral disc and the associated inflammatory changes that occur in the adjacent nerves. Muscular imbalance and spasm are thereby relieved. Other problems such as neck pain, hip and knee arthritis, limp and gait disturbances, frozen shoulder, and a variety of other orthopedic conditions are usually markedly improved. Tension headaches, asthma, and problems with balance and coordination generally benefit as well. On my website, there is a special video just for the performing arts. Used by musicians, singers, dancers, and actors for over 100 years, the Alexander Technique is taught at the Juilliard in New York, New York University, UCLA. You can feel how there's a change in your breathing coordination. 
The patterns of the breath are different. And the prestigious Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, in addition to the Royal Academy of Music. As you might expect, many of the most talented and famous performers and celebrities have studied the technique. Optimal use of self is of great value in all sports and athletics. This allows an athlete to run faster, move quicker, with less effort, thereby increasing both endurance and available power. When we try very hard or too hard, we also misuse our body. We uh, move in ways which are detrimental to our body and the quality of our life is affected. Increasingly, health and fitness advocates are adding Alexander to their activities as it is of great value in enhancing general health and a feeling of well-being. Think how much better you will look, upright and more alert without stiffness. No more slumping and poor posture, poise and lightness in all your activities. Spring in your step and even a sparkle in your eye. The Alexander Technique is a way of being in your life. It teaches you to include your whole body in everything you do. I'm 60 years old and I feel great. The beauty of the Alexander Technique is that it gives us a double benefit. It can definitely help prevent the disability of old age and it gives us a better life now at any age. It has taken on a transformational role in my life. To feel that I'm in charge rather than victimized by the tension in my system, that I get to choose in any given moment how I feel. The Alexander Technique, as far as I'm concerned, is the premier approach to learning that gives you a true understanding of mind-body awareness. One of the advantages that we've had in, in our practice, and that is Judy and mine, is that we have seen patients get significantly better with the Alexander Technique. It's an approach that is so simple, but it just centers you. It really does bring about a sense of self and peace. And I know it sounds too good to be true, but what's really important for you to understand is that over the last 100 or so years since the Alexander Technique has been taught, it's clear that this technique is a very powerful approach. Can you imagine a life that's designed to give you pleasure in every movement you make? Washing the dishes, typing on the computer, walking. To have a life that is much freer of tension than you would imagine is a total possibility. In this presentation, we've attempted to tell you how and why habitual misuse occurs. We've described the associated poor posture, suboptimal movement and fatigue, as well as the physical ailments and disabilities that may develop because of it. We've told you about its insidious nature, that we are generally unaware of it, and importantly, that we can't change and improve without help. Alexander's story of discovery over 100 years ago is as pertinent today as ever. His technique has stood the test of time and scientific scrutiny. The technique gives us an effective method for changing bad habits to eliminate misuse and greatly improve our lives. We've explained how and why it works and how it is taught. Many thousands have benefited all over the world. Now, it's up to you. Are you ready to give it a try?